uh, see, it's one, it's, it's one o'clock. Uh, I think we'll start, start this session. My name's Keith Bartholomew. I'm on the National Grazing Lands Coalition Board from North Dakota, and uh, I represent the Association, National Association of Conservation Districts on that board. Uh, this topic that we're coming up in this session will be extending the grazing season to minimize feed costs which is something near and dear to my heart, especially in North Dakota. We have long winters and cold long winters, and I'm hoping to pick up something here. So with that, uh, that's my part of the program. Uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, Mr. Brian Weech from Parker, Colorado, and he's going to be the, the moderator of this symposium. So, Brian? Thank you. Uh, when we talk about sustainability in ranching community, you know, there's a lot of elements that are involved with sustainability. One of the most important is profitability. Uh, if we can't be profitable as ranchers, we can't be sustainable. So with that in mind, we've developed a, uh, a uh, program today, a uh, panel discussion, um, and I'll introduce those panelists in a second. But the idea is to hear from a variety of people uh, that have been invited to, uh, to speak to us. The idea is for us to have a discussion. So if you have a question at any point, we encourage you to ask your questions, raise your hand, shout it out, whatever you need to do. Um, we encourage that. And then after each of the presenters give a short 10, 15 minute kind of introduction, some context, um, then we'll have a panel discussion where you'll have a chance to ask additional questions. Does that work for everybody? Okay, very good. So my name is Brian Weech. I am uh, with uh, Berenbrug USA. I represent Berenbrug in the Western United States. And uh, my job is to help people like yourselves be successful um, in your grazing operations. And so I, uh, I noticed a poster out here uh, from Virginia Cooperative called uh, Grazing 300. Any, any of you seen that poster? Really interesting poster. I encourage you to, to take a look at it. I'm just going to quote a few statistics that were on that poster. 80% of ranchers feed hay for, oh, for at least 120 days. 49% of the ranchers in the United States feed hay for over 150 days. So when we look at the way to meet the nutritional needs of cow herd, Feeding hay is the absolute most expensive way that we can do that, generally speaking. Only less than 10% of ranchers in the United States feed hay for less than 100 days. So my point in this is there's a lot of opportunity uh, to improve the profitability of the average uh, ranch in the United States. Um, and here's the thing, extending grazing to 300 days nets a return of over $79 per head per cow. So with that, that's the spirit that we come to you all today is there's opportunity. So how do we capture that opportunity? We think we're gonna share some ideas today. Um, again, we encourage your discussion, uh, your questions, your input. If you have some ideas, we encourage you to share those as well. So with that, um, our three speakers today, and I think I'm going to do this in the order they're going to speak, is Sam Gross with Berenbrug USA, Dan Glenn with Deep Grazing, uh, Deep Grass Grazers, and then Peter Bowerstead also with Berenbrug USA. So with that, Sam, I'll invite you to come up. I was looking for the remote. Oh, well. I'm going to get started. So uh, thank you, Brian. My name is Sam Gross, and I am the Southeastern United States Forage Ambassador for Barron Brug USA. Uh, I did not have not done very well at retirement, but I'm also Phil Faculty Emeritus of North Carolina State University Extension. I spent 25 years with them, working for them, taught school for 10 years prior to joining Extension, so I well earned my pension in North Carolina. And uh, but when I was with Extension, I was uh, primarily a livestock agent through most of my career and developed a strong love and strong interest in forages. And so in central North Carolina, I sort of became known as the forage and weed guy. And um, after retirement, um, I did get called back to extension for a year. And then this position with Baron Brug opened up and it's really almost like a vacation for me because I get to go around uh, the southeastern United States 
and talk to livestock producers about growing grass to feed their animals. And so that just is my passion. Now, where this sort of started, and I'm thinking about, I've got some slides, and I'm really going to go into some philosophy in a few minutes, uh, uh, some things for us to think about as grass growers, as grass farmers. And I will tell you, if you do not consider yourself a grass farmer, you're never going to be a really good livestock producer, all right? Because we've got to be willing to grow that grass that we need to feed our animals. But early in my career, I had a producer in my county uh, by the name of Dick Bevere. Uh, unfortunately, Dick, Dick lost his life to uh, appendicitis, of all things. He was, went through the VA hospital in uh, Durham, North Carolina, and unfortunately, they killed him. Uh, but Dick had a small farm in Chatham County, North Carolina, and he had 40 head of purebred Hereford cattle. He was running 40 cow-calf pairs. Now, anybody want to take a guess on how many acres he was running that 40 pair of cattle on? Well, I'll tell you, 40 acres. Now, you're sitting here going, 40 pairs on 40 acres? That can't be done. I'll tell you how many square bales of hay Dick fed in a year on a typical year. 200. Not round bales. I'm talking 50, 60 pound square bales. Now, Dick had a watering system like you would not believe. He had a black poly pipe laid out. In the summer, he let the grass grow up over it to shade it. In the winter, he, he weeded the grass off of it, just plain old well pipe. He put taps in it every 50 feet. He had a portable water with a float on it. Wherever his cows were that day, he put that water tank in there. He put another pan with minerals in it. He gave those 40 head about a quarter of an acre of mixed grasses every day. He moved them every day, and, but big thing is he back fenced them. So they were in that smaller area, flash grazing that area. And he was successful in raising 40 pairs of 40 acres. And he had grass all the time because he was using a variety of, of species not everything planted together. He had, did have some diversity within his given areas, but he was planting different species. This was one reason that my interest in Berenberg was piqued, because in my area that I was in in North Carolina, we had a close influence to uh, this uh, school called the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I mean, excuse me, I get that E and that I mixed up all the time. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, some different ideas come out of there. And so as a part of my job, I was getting a lot of folks that really wanted to think outside of the box. And that was one reason I uh, early on had developed a love for Berenbrug because they actually had a portfolio of seed where I could actually talk to people that wanted to do things differently and wanted to work outside of the box. Now, as I promised you, um, <clears throat> We are going to do, talk just a little bit about a little philosophy. Number one, only properly managed pastures will be properly yielding. To grow good forage, it takes management. Now, I have a small farm, about 60 acres in the Piedmont of North Carolina, and it is a frustration for me sometimes. I love it. It helps me to maintain my sanity. But on the other hand, it also provides a level of frustration because I still can't seem to get the time and the money to do everything that I know that needs to be done. And so I know what I should be doing, but sometimes just can't seem to get it accomplished. As I was talking to extension clients and I talk to people now in my role with Berenbrug, I say, make a plan. But everybody thinks that plan's got to happen in one or two years. I'm telling you, it doesn't have to happen in one or two years. I'm talking a four or a five or a six year role. I tell a lot of stories. My first job out of college was teaching high school uh, vocational agriculture. Now they call it agricultural education. When I was preparing for my teaching job and a student at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, my dad just lamb blasted teachers. He said, oh, teachers have it easy. They make a lot of money. They don't work a full eight hour day all this kind of thing. Well, then I go, his oldest son goes into teaching high school and his opinion of teachers changes 180%. They don't pay teachers enough. They expect teachers to work all the time. 
Uh, these teachers have to put up with these rowdy kids. And so his opinion of teachers changed. Well, I also grew up with my dad saying, I can't afford for the extension agent to come to my house. I can't afford for that. Then, lo and behold, his oldest son ends up in extension. But I still have Carl Gross in the back of my head going, I can't afford for the extension agent to come to my house. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's going to cost you some money. But when you take and you do it and you make a plan and you spread it out over four or five, six years to reach that end goal, it's not like you're having to spend all that at one time. So you need to make these goals, whether it be rotational grazing, whether it be setting your farm up with different species in different areas so that you can manage those species for optimum performance, which I'll cover in just a, in a minute. One of the key principles of establishing a grass is, and I, I couldn't be a, a, a good former extension agent or an ambassador from Barenbrook without mentioning this. When you get ready to grow grass, before you start planting the seed, you need to get a soil test done. Now, in North Carolina, it's easy. The NCDA, our North Carolina Department of Agriculture, does soil testing free April through November, and then they charge $4 a sample December through March through the, during the busy season. Waters Lab, I think, out of Georgia is maybe $5 a sample. I'm not sure how other states work. But that is going to be money extremely well spent. You need to know what your phosphorus levels are. You need to know what your potassium levels are. You need to know what your pH is. And then you need to spend the money to get the nutrients, to change that soil chemistry, to make it right for that soil to grow grass. Remember, soil is just the surface layer of earth in which plants grow. That's it. Now, we have regions of the country where we have very rich soils, very loamy soils. I'm from an area where a byproduct of our soils is bricks. I'm from very tight clay soil. You get it wet, you mold it in a rectangular shape, punch three holes in it and put it in an oven and bake it and you got bricks. That's a byproduct of where I'm from. But we can still grow grass if you get the soil chemistry right. So if you're gonna have a robust vegetative growth of that grass, you've got to have equal amount or more of root system in the ground. Now, the news media and um, some groups have villainized phosphorus. Phosphorus is a bad thing. Phosphorus, we used to use phosphorus in our soaps to clean our clothes, and then it become a bad thing. But if we don't have adequate phosphorus in the soil, you're never gonna get that root system to develop to its fullest. If you see a plant growing and it turns a little cool, and then you see the leaves turn purple, whether it be grass, whether it be corn, whether it be wheat, guess what? That plant's not taking up enough phosphorus. But you need to make sure that that is in the soil, and a soil test is important. Now, I'm not up here to give you a sales pitch, but I'll tell you, if you buy, were to buy our variety of seed, it's going to cost you, it's not going to be the cheapest seed out there, but we have the technology, we stand behind our seed. But I tell folks, don't go buy our seed until you have a soil test done and you're ready to plant. And you've got to be ready to plant because I can speak more for the southeast, but if your phosphorus is low, your potassium is low, especially your pH is low, you need a pH between 6.0 and 6.5 for most grasses, you may need to put it out there and put the disc to it. Now, I don't want to advocate destroying soil structure, but lime and phosphorus is, is not very leachable. So it doesn't move through the soil profile very rapidly. So in that case, if you need a lot, the first step you would do is put that out there and put a disc to it or a rototiller to get it mixed into the top four inches of soil to the root zone, what we call the root zone. There's a lot of similarities between pasture management and turf grass management than there are differences. I know in my area, I can speak of this, we, we think that lawns and pastures are a whole lot different. But I can just give you this from the North Carolina recommendations on tall fescue. So if we're seeding tall fescue in a pasture, we recommend about 25 pounds to the acre. If you're seeding tall fescue as a lawn grass, the recommendation is five to six pounds per thousand square feet. So if you take that five to six pounds per thousand square feet, multiply it by 43.56, it's gonna come out 250 pounds of fescue seed per acre for a lawn. You see, in a pasture, we want it to be able to bunch. It's a bunch of grass. 
So we want it to be able to bunch up to tiller out and to spread. That's how we get our yield. But in a lawn, you want it to stay individual grass blades. And so that's the reason for the higher seeding recommendation. But you see, there's also those similarities. And I, I forgot about this. So if most people manage their pastures as well as they manage their lawns, we would have a lot of overweight livestock. We would have a lot more forage value and forage quality and quantity uh, than we do. You see, I know this looks like an elementary school slide, like kindergarten slide, but I did this years ago just to make a point. When I'm talking about the similarities between a lawn and a pasture, you see each of these species is basically a lawnmower. But the difference on these lawnmowers, and by the way, my wife let me buy a brand new Bobcat Zero Turn mower this spring. I've been happy as a lark. But you know, when I want to adjust the height on that Bobcat Zero Turn mower, I push in a pedal, lift up the deck, I reach down and I change a little clasp into a different setting and that changes the height, height of my blades. I've got an old 2006 John Deere X500 driving mower that I still use. It's got a knob right down here between your legs where you turn it and you raise the blades up and you adjust the height of your cutting deck. Neither one of these species has any type of height adjustment on it. What is the height adjustment when we mow our pastures with these animals? All right, yeah, you can participate, okay? Time is one of them, but who, who is the height adjustment? Where, where does the height adjustment come from? It comes from us. It comes from us moving those animals, us controlling those animals with something like rotational grazing, intensive rotational grazing, having the fences, having the poly wire where we can move the animals around when the grass is grazed down to the proper level, then we move the animals off of it. If we graze too close, the reason lawns look so well, if we're dealing with a cool season grass, and see, I'm in a fun area. I'm in the transition zone of the transition state. So where I'm at, we can't grow cool season grasses or warm season grasses to their fullest, but we can grow both warm and cool season grasses. But on cool season grasses, Generally, we don't set our lawnmowers any closer than three inches. Maybe two and a half inches, but generally three inches. Well, see, we leave a lot of leaf surface there. That's a solar collector. That grass immediately starts growing back. But when we've grazed down, if, if you've got any type, whether it be a novel or a just a regular tall fescue, go out sometime to one that's grown up real tall and then pull it up and look at the base. The top closest to the sun is nice and green. But right down at the base, anybody thinking about what I'm talking about, can you see it in your mind? What color is it? It's turning white because there's no chlorophyll there. So when we graze that down to where there's no chlorophyll, guess what the plant's got to do first? It's got to produce chlorophyll to get back in that leaf. Chlorophyll's the solar collector that converts sunlight into energy to fuel the photosynthetic reaction in the plant. And it's got to do all that before it can ever start growing. So controlling that grazing height is extremely, extremely important for growing gra grass and keeping it coming back. All right, that is my brief uh, introduction and some philosophy uh, as we get this thing started. Thank you, Brian. Who knows who Barenbrug is? Anyone know? Okay, Barenbrug is a 115-year-old seed company. We specialize in grass seed, um, international company, our, but uh, the U.S. is our, our biggest operating yeah, company. Our, our, our office, our main warehouse is in Tangent, Oregon, but we have uh, people like Sam and myself all over the United States and Canada. Um, our mission, part of our mission, is to improve sustainability by increasing the productivity of animal production through the use of our products. And so we are very excited to sponsor uh, conferences like this. We're very proud to do that because the knowledge that uh, that is instilled here is just so very critical. So with that, Dan, I'll let you introduce yourself and then we'll go from there. Great. Yes, please do. What, what are, how do we reverse the overgrazed pasture? 
the big well go, go one of it. the biggest things from the east coast is we can graze so many more animals on an acre than they can say out west because we can really grow the grass now we still have this mentality on the east coast a, a lot of older producers of the wide open ranges out west of the cowboys so whereas and i've still got one 17 acre field that 17 acre field really needs to be subdivided at least three ways all right so that we can move our cattle around more we've got more places to put them that is that is a goal i've had in life and have not got it completely done yet to get more pastures developed get smaller areas so that we can keep our cattle moving and not leave them sitting in the same place week after week month after month yeah yeah someone said it earlier time right the time is a key management factor both the time that cattle are on a pasture grazing but also the time you're allowing that pasture to rest and recuperate great yeah. um yeah i got added last minute to this program and grateful for the opportunity. It was funny, I was talking with Sam and we got to talking about forages and um, he asked me, you know, if I'd ever used T-Raptor, which is a Baron Brug product. And I was like, oh my God, I love T-Raptor. And then he was like, well, have you ever used, uh, you know, any of the crabgrasses? I was like, oh yeah, I've used you guys crabgrasses. Next thing I know, I'm invited to speak at the panel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here I am, uh, but grateful for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Dan Glenn. I'm from South Georgia. Deep, I'm with Deep Grass Graziers. Um, just to kind of give you an idea to place me, um, I'm about an hour north of the Florida line. So I uh, moved back to my family farm where I grew up um, about 11 years ago and had the opportunity to take over my cow herd, uh, my family's cow herd. Um, and we were kind of a conventional uh, cow-calf operation, retaining stockers through the winter, feeding them uh, silage uh, and uh, fattening them up and selling truckload lots in the spring. And the more uh, I kind of got into my education of cattle, the more I realized that, you know, it was, all, it was really all about growing grass. And the more I got into the, the ideas and the, and, the, and the concepts of growing grass, I realized, hey, it's all about soil health. And, and, and as I've you know, gone down this road, I really got interested in producing the, a better mama cow, producing a mama cow that's going to that's gonna harvest a lot of her forage and us not take a lot of the forage to her. Because the, the key to making money in the cow business is not spending money in the cow business. And anytime we can get away, we can get in between uh, the cow and her uh, harvesting her own forage. Uh, that, that's how we can. That's how we can save money. That's how we can make money. Um, so, uh, so anyway, uh, Irwin County. I'm a Bahia Bermuda base, uh, and that's zone 8B. So we don't really, you know, we we have some frost days. Um, it it probably gets down in the teens every once in a while, but uh, we don't have a lot of cold days. Um, right now we're about at uh, 400 cow-calf pairs, uh, kind of depending on the year. I will harvest anywhere from three to say 15 grass-finished beeves. Um, uh, often, uh, here recently it's been open heifers. Um, I've kind of gotten away from keeping steers because um, depending on what the marketplace looks like, if you've got a, you know, a finished 1,200 pound steer, you've only got one place to take him and that's to sell him direct. Um, or you're just taking the price a, a lot of times at the marketplace, which is nothing. So it's much safer to, to finish a heifer. It's easy to finish a heifer. And um, my open heifers, I can value add and sell those direct to, to the consumer. Um, we also, uh, th that's kind of the main business right now. We, we, we develop heifers for sale. We develop, uh, and they, uh, we keep a certain number of those every year. They go in the cow herd. We also sell a lot of our older cows. A lot of our customers want a proven cow, and we're happy to, as you know, as we save this many every year, we're happy to sell some. Um, because, and, and we also sell uh, some seed stock bulls, uh, even some commercial bulls that are uh, raised on our farm, roughed in pretty good. We develop them on forage. Uh, I was talking with you know, people earlier today. When you develop bulls on forage only, um, with almost zero supplement, there's a big sort between the top end and the bottom end. And that's, that's great for my customer to be able to come in and say, that's the bull I want. That's the bull that can do it on forage, which means his daughters typically are gonna be able to do it on forage. And that's what we breed for. We don't breed for terminal traits. Um, we, we want our customers to be able to breed for terminal traits if they choose to sell all their calves. W uh, we sell bulls that go into programs for people who want to save females and improve their herd. So uh, I think a lot of you probably know these, but I just wanted to share them with you anyway because it's kind of the backbone of what we're talking about today. If you understand soil health principles, it goes a long ways towards being able to grow more grass and feed less hay. Uh, and 
One thing I think that we need to be thoughtful of, though, uh, it's not always bad to feed hay. Um, I think that we don't, we don't want to feed hay for 120 days a year. Uh, but there are times where feeding hay by removing cows from maybe something that's been overgrazed or a strategic time to feed hay for whatever your purposes are, it, it could be useful. And sometimes you can make more money feeding a little hay than you can feed zero hay. And that goes back to the idea of uh, profitability. How, how much are cows bringing this year? Are they bringing a lot? If they're bringing a lot, I can probably afford to feed a little more hay and have a higher carrying capacity. If they're in the cellar, then I probably want to have a lower carrying capacity and feed as little hay as possible. So I think we need to be thoughtful of hay as a, as a supplement, but not as, a, you know, as our main thing that we're going to lean on in the wintertime. But year-round living cover, minimizing disturbance, both chemical and physical, maximizing diversity, and residual unrest um, are the four keys to soil health. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to design a, a forage chain or when you're trying to feed as many days as possible, I think one of the things you need to think about are the adapted species in my area. Um, and then from those adapted species, you can kind of put together that forage chain of, of can we graze 12 months out of the year? Can we graze 10 months out of the year? Can we graze, you know, 9 or 11? Um, be really thoughtful about what works. And a lot of times, you know, if you're new to this, your neighbors have already figured this out, or some of your neighbors might have. So it's always a good idea to look in our area or in your zone to the people who are doing a good job. Um, this is an, uh, so we do a good bit of annuals. Um, you know, I told you we develop bulls and females on forages. Well, our young calves are gonna need nutrition beyond what our perennials can provide. Bahay and Bermuda grass are very low energy uh, have very low energy uh, in, their, in the grasses. We don't do a lot of fertilization of our Bahia pastures. Um, we really um, want our pastures to produce what they will without a lot of props. Um, and by props, I mean a lot of fertilizer. So uh, while it is important to soil test, absolutely, especially with annuals, and, and anytime you know, th that pH gets too low, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't pay attention to fertility, but at the same time, if, you are, if, if your beef program relies upon heavy amounts of fer fertilization, just recognize that your price also is dependent upon what that outside fertilization does. And, and as we see today and as we'll see next year, um, you better pencil uh, pretty tight to figure out how much fertility you want to put down because it's really expensive and getting more expensive. Um, but with annuals, uh, on our, our dirt especially, our organic matter levels are anywhere from less than 1% to as high as 25 to 3 That's it. Um, on, our, on our row crop land, it's around 1%. On our pastures that have been undisturbed for you know 20 to 50 years, we have some as high as 3 But that, that's about it. We're, we're sandy loam. Uh, soils. So they do require a little fertility, added fertility, if we want to grow anything. Um, but I have used a multiple species mixes um, to try to promote soil health. We've done both winter and um, summer. Uh, and with winter, we've done some that we wanted to graze in the fall, in uh, November, December. And then we've done some full season as well. That's a very good question, and it poses into my second slide. Yeah, very good. So when you have, when you start throwing together a bunch of seeds, recognize that there are management challenges to that. Um, if you've got ryegrass in this mix, the ryegrass isn't going to be ready before the brassicas are ready. So whatever the dominant species in the, is in there, then you're going to you're going to basically graze to it. Now, if you leave it there too long, like for instance, we put a bunch of cows in a small area, and this was a grazing mistake. And I mean, we only turned around for a day, but like they, they scrubbed it. Uh, and when you do that, you're losing time. You know, you're taking way more than half. Uh, and with annuals, sometimes you can get away with that, but uh, it could cost you a graze. If you manage winter annuals really well, I can sometimes get three to four grazings out of them. If I manage them poorly, I typically get two. Um, but to answer your question, brassicas, and, and that's one reason why we tried to go for a fall mix where we used, where we knew we could come in in November and then a full season mix, which we knew we'd probably lean on heavier in January, February, and March. Do you graze Yes. Yeah, brassicas, you can't really harvest uh, with a cutter. Um, they're too wet. Um, is that what you're talking about, making hay or baleage? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, just a gorgeous shot, uh, chicory, vetch, uh, clover, um, ryegrass, um, 
you know, chicory and, and um, plantain, there's plantain in there as well, are two things that we really liked in our, um, in our pasture mixes, especially not in our annuals as much as in our pastures because they were things that were persistent and stuck around, uh, very high protein, uh, deep rooted. Um, we, we, we in, uh, in fact, I've gotten, kind of gotten back into planting those in my permanent pastures as well. Wouldn't necessarily recommend them in an annual mix as much because they're expensive. Um, you can see this is one of the winter mix we used. Uh, we used a spring oat, some ryegrass, some hairy vetch, some crimson clover, some T-raptor, and some Winfred. And those are all species that worked really well for us, and, and that's kind of a, a rate. Um, and $47 an acre, not cheap by any means, but uh, I think each farm needs to decide how much they can, how much they can spend on a winter feeding program uh, based on what they're trying to accomplish. Um, so just be thoughtful of that. Uh, when you're grazing annuals, timing is critical. Um, knowing when to graze those things. There's so many times in the fall or in the early winter we're like, oh, we need grazing so bad. Oh, I really want to put the cows on there. Uh, but recognize if you put cows on annuals too early, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So really give it a chance. So this, uh, you know, we're like, oh, are we there yet? And then that was two weeks later and you couldn't walk through it, it was so thick. But now that's headed out. Uh, that's a little, it's a slightly past prime. And again, when you're doing multiple mixes, everything may or may not be ready at the same time. Um, but that was a grazing radish um, that's uh, the white. And they, they ate it. They don't love grazing radish, but you can see that's, that's after moving the bulls through there. And we, we could do, on our winter mixes, we could do about that range from about a pound and a half to two and a half pounds a day. Some of these, you know, especially the brassicas can get really wet, have a lot of protein. You've got to be very cautious of, uh, if you've got mostly brassicas, you either really need to time those, time, uh, ideally time graze them, so that you're giving those annuals only so much of their diet in brassicas. Otherwise, they're, they're gonna be, don't stand behind them. This was an overseed, so this was in some Bahia Bermuda pastures, kind of wet. Uh, but we had really good success with hairy vetch, crimson clover, and some cereal rye in there. As you can see, the cereal rye is kind of past prime, but the hairy vetch is actually climbing up it pretty good, which was neat. Hairy vetch has been something that, be careful because it'll produce hard seed and it'll stick around. But if you give hairy vetch time, it will produce a tremendous amount of biomass in a, uh, um, with very little inputs. It, it can also kill cows. So very rare, but hairy vetch poisoning uh, is a thing. If that's all they have and they eat it at the mature state, it is, it is possible, although I still plant it every year. This was one I was talking about our fall mixes. This is a mix that we had great success with. Everleaf oat is a, is a spring oat. Um, it looks, it's got a black hull. Um, and we used quite a bit of Everleaf with T-Raptor, and that was just a tremendous combination for us. It got ready at the same time. We planted it in late September, and we came in in November, and we're grazing it. And, it. and it was very efficient, too, for only 40 units of nitrogen. I mean, you can see where that T-post is, I mean, or that uh, step-in post. I mean, that stuff was, was really good. Now, that's clean till. Um, and we've had more success with our brassicas in clean till than in overseed. One of the only brassicas we've really found successful was the grazing radish in our overseed program. And you see that seed cost is a little more, but um, we got three to three and a half grazings out of that, so we managed it pretty well. Uh, one thing to ask, uh, let's see where we are at time. Uh, um, thinking about polycultures versus monocultures, I've showed you a lot of polycultures, and one of the reasons we plant polycultures is because we're trying to mimic nature. You know, as we've heard earlier, uh, there are no monocultures in nature. So, uh, so as we're trying to feed our cattle, as we're trying to extend our grazing season, we're also thinking about feeding the soil biology. And one of the reasons we do that is, is by planting multiple species. But there are challenges in grazing. Um, there can be sometimes, uh, you know, you may or may not be able to produce as many pounds per acre of, of dry matter. However, we have found some interesting um, observations through accident. It seems like how many times do accidents like give us insight into farms? Um, this was uh, where we left, um, we left a species mix in our drill and we were coming in late uh, and, we were, uh, and we were just gonna plant a cereal rye for seed in part of this field. Well, part of it was actually some leftover seed. And so we had um, cereal rye, what do we have? Cereal rye, crimson clover, oats, and there might have been vetch. Um, so the whole thing had only 50 units for the season. And you could see that strip 
there was three to four times as much biomass in that one strip uh, than there was in the monoculture cereal rye, which just astounded me. Like, I, I, I still don't really get it because to me, um, the science wouldn't tell me that just having five species in there would, would, would do so well. Um, you know, so thinking about your forage chain, you know, if we want to feed hay less, where are our problem areas? You know, for us, it's uh, October. It's, it's starting in September, October, and November. We can grow winter annuals, so we can graze December through May. Um, we've obviously have perennial grasses that run us from March through, you know, September. Um, but in September, our perennial grasses, the energy is doing this. Um, so we really have trouble for that end of September, October, November period. So we need to think about, you know, what is it that I can plant that can get me grazing during that period? Is it a stockpile? Is it a summer stockpile? Is it a really trying to get in in September for us and plant that brassica oat mix so that we could potentially be grazing at maybe as early as the end of October? Um, those are the things we need to think about if we want to stop feeding hay or lessen it, I should say. Uh, another thing we do is we stockpile Bermuda grass. So this is TIF 85. Um, so instead of taking that last cutting of hay, um, or right around in September, right around we, we take our probably third cutting, we'll go in and fertilize just like we were going to um, take another cutting of hay. And then instead of harvesting that hay, we just let it go. Um, and then the key to it, though, is A, to eat it. Well, if you eat it green, they love it. If you let it get frosted, they'll eat it, but they don't love it as much. As long as you don't feed hay before you show them that frosted Bermuda grass, they'll eat it. Um, but the key is to give them about daily moves. If you give them more than a two-day move or a three-day move, they go in and waste, and they really don't want to eat a lot. you got to be cautious because depending on how much fertilizer you put down, and we typically don't put a lot, um, the quality can be still kind of decline. 85 holds up pretty well, better than some of the other grasses. Um, but it's a cheap feed. You know, they're harvesting it themselves. I don't have anybody cranking a tractor going out feeding hay. I don't have hay waste if I move the fence every day. So there's an, another example of stockpile at 85. And you can see kind of we, you know, we've got some density. Now, um, we can frontal graze there, right? So all I got to do is move the fence up. And I can allow them to back graze. It's not a problem because they've already eaten it. So I don't have to worry about regrowth and protecting that regrowth. Um, that's another example of a, of a summer stockpile. So this was uh, sorghum sudan, pearl millet, cowpea, sun hemp. Um, and th there you can see that was an area that got deferred grazing and actually gave the cowpea a chance to come on. Uh, a lot of times the cowpea really only comes on after the second graze because the pearl millet, the sun hemp, and the sorghum sudan just kind of come out of the ground running. Uh, and the cowpea doesn't really, doesn't grow as, as aggressively. Now, if we kind of flash graze through there, take about half of it off. That's when the cowpea's had a chance to put its roots down, and then it, it will kind of trellis up those taller plants, which is nice. Um, that's me. Um, you know, one thing I want to add, and I think that's really important, is uh, stocking rate is so important, and understanding what your, the capacity of your farm and your management and getting your stocking rate right. You know, I've found as a producer, uh, I constantly and probably have more cows on my property than I need to to be profitable. Um, but, you know, we, we value add, we sell replacement cows, we put a good bit of pressure on our cows and we sell that. But knowing how many cows will make you the most money is one of the most important decisions you can make on your farm. Um, you know, it, it's, and it's probably more than likely a lot of people have more cows on their property than they need. Um, so just be very thoughtful about, you know, how much money you're making per head um, and how much hay you're feeding. And if you feel like you're feeding too much hay, it might be that either you need to start doing more managed grazing or maybe you would make more money feeding less hay and having a few less cows. And you can kind of tell that sometimes too, especially when you have a lot of rainfall. So if you have a lot of rainfall, um, you know, it kind, of, it kind of props up your numbers. But when you go through a drought, you realize, wow, now I'm feeding hay. Always have a drought plan, too, so. Yeah. Great presentation, Dan, yep. excellent. Questions for Dan? Okay, we have a chance to ask more questions later. But Dan really exemplifies some wonderful things you can do with forages to minimize hay feeding. Um, and if these are things you're interested in, please come find us. We have a booth over here and we'll uh, be happy to talk 
more specifics about how these things that you just saw are done. Let me, let me tell you, Barenbrook has a program called Pinpoint, and it's all about um, figuring out where your forge gaps are and then finding products that you can use to, to fill those forge gaps. We've talked a lot about annuals and things. Um, let me, while Peter's getting his slides ready, um, in places like Montana, very harsh, harsh climates, they're using perennial uh, grasses in the mix. Specifically a mix, a relatively new mix for us called Barricade, which is a dry land mix. They're using it so that they can grow, graze that in the spring and the fall and save their native pastures and, and stretch their grazing. And um, uh, a particular ranch out there, Seabin Livestock, is using that. And uh, I was just there in September. And their comment was by implementing this type of grazing program, they've essentially doubled their productivity of their ranch. The comment was, we, we've essentially bought a new ranch, but didn't have to pay for any more land. Um, and that's in a year where they only have had six inches of rain. So these sort of things are, you know, there, there are management strategies you can use in various places that can help to stretch your forage. So with that, Peter, I'll let you add. Is it on now? Is it? Sounds different. Okay. Sorry about that fumble with the technology. Um, I, I really want to thank Dan for jumping in at the last minute and giving that presentation. And anything I can say is just going to be a downer. So I'll try to keep it brief. Um, these aren't new ideas. This idea of making money from grass, this is something that's been around for a while. This happens to be the cover of a publication that was written by the founder of Barenbrug uh, when he was looking at the US market. And this is from, when was this? The early, oh, right at the top, 1908. I put the slide together, I should know. So you can find this thing on Amazon as a print-on-demand document. Um, but again, another source, 1922, Yearbook of Agriculture. The cheapest of all feed is pasture because it furnishes a balanced ration at low cost and the cow does her own harvesting. In comparatively few cases is the fullest possible use made of pasture. So this was something in 1922. Again, not a new idea. If you're a history buff and you like to look at why we're where we are today and how we got here, that's a wonderful conversation and I'd like to look into, into it some more. Um, but one more time, just to hammer the point home, pasture is cheaper than any feed that comes on a truck. But it's an interesting observation that has been made that when you look at climates as diverse as Mississippi to Wisconsin, and you find all you know, farmers across that region feeding 140 days of hay, I think that Mississippi has a longer growing season than Wisconsin. Let's, is there a rule that says that you have to feed 140 days? Is that some tradition and I, I don't, and some work out of uh, Canada showing that each day grazing is extended, the cow-calf sector saves nearly $4 million. So this is something that could have a very large impact over the entire industry, let alone on individual farms. Um, There's no magic bullet here, again, known things, but these have been put forward by others. Uh, key is improved grazing management, managing the resource that you do have, allocating that out, not letting the animal be in charge of what it eats, controlling, managing your livestock, which is gonna require some infrastructure and that's a conversation we can have, but we just saw a demonstration of low, relatively low tech these days, ways to accomplish that. Um, the use of legumes, we need to find the best adapted legumes and do what we can to get them into the swords uh, for quality as well as fertility. 
uh, reduce hay needs overall, and there's a number of ways you can do that. Stockpiling feed from periods of growth to periods of lower growth, sort of a hay on the stump, if you will, and then summer and winter annuals to fill gaps. Again, nothing new, but one demonstration of a 300-day grazing system at University of Arkansas with over 150 on-farm demonstrations in 50 counties, over $300,000 in direct savings to the producers that enroll. This is a few years ago, so the you know, costs are going to change, but again, um, as was mentioned, we have this pinpoint system. Please stop by and talk to us. Uh, happy to talk about that some more. Uh, you, anybody here read Andre Voisson's book? Yeah, yeah. Honest man, I like it. Um, but what's mind-blowing to me is he was trying to do managed grazing when he was dealing with hard fences, like rock hard fences and things. And what, what could he have done if he had had the portable temporary or the high impedance, uh, sorry, high voltage, low impedance, you know, fixed wire fencing and the chargers that we have today? <clears throat> Uh, here's another study, University of Arkansas, rotational strip grazing. Uh, strip graze, doubled grazing days on stockpiled forage, saved an extra $10 per animal unit versus continuous grazing. Continuous grazing can be a viable tool, but it's a tool. It's, it has to be applied. You know, somebody said you give a monkey a hammer, don't make him a mechanic, you know, or toolkit, don't make him a mechanic, it makes him dangerous, right? Um, electric fence construction saved nine producers almost $15,000 versus traditional fence. But I'm an agronomist by training, so that's one of my boxes and worldviews and potential blind spots, so I'll own it. Um, but again, if you have low pH, if you have low phosphorus, if you have low potassium, these things need to be addressed. Um, but if you don't have, so <laughs> let, me, let me digest for just a moment and tell you a personal story that uh, I spent a significant amount of time out of agriculture. And as I was coming back into it and involved a couple coincidences, but I found myself at an Oregon Forage and Grassland Council field day and you know the, the bulls were standing around outside the tool shed when there was a meeting going on inside and we were you know, pawing and solving the world's problems. And somebody brought up new varieties or whatever and I was not in the seed industry at this point. And I said, you know, if you don't have control of your livestock in terms of fencing and watering, then selling you a higher yielding variety may not be the best thing for you. And this man gave me a really strange look. And it turned out a couple of months later that that man was the man that hired me for my job at Barenbrook. <laughs> but if, if, you know, if, if all you're growing is, let's just say, perennial ryegrass or tall fescue, and I give you a new variety and yields more, when is it likely to yield that? when you probably already have too much for you to manage because you don't have the fencing, you don't have the water. So I've done nothing to help you. I've made your problem worse. Because as some people have taught me, it's harder to manage periods of excess growth than it is periods of low growth. And we could talk about that later. But in any case, fertility needs need to be taken care of. There's lots of ways to get legumes into stands. <clears throat> People have tried some that don't seem to work real well, but frost seeding seems to be a solid way to, to get um, red clover, white clover for specifics into orchard grass or tall fescue, cool season pastures, especially in the northeastern U.S., but other parts of the country as well. Um, I have a note here of... Um, something like $4,600 savings for two producers versus nitrogen fertilizer cost on grass. And that was 2010. So I'm sure nitrogen is going to be less expensive this year than it was in 2010, right? 
Yeah, there it is, okay. We have a number of products that might fit. I wanna keep the sales down a little bit, but it's my day job. So one thing to, you know, if you're looking at cost of feeding hay, one of the things you need to look at is what does it cost you to make hay? Okay, now in the Northwest, we have a seed industry. And for the last several decades, they haven't been allowed to burn the seed fields after seed harvest. So what that created was this business of coming in, so we, we have standing crops, we windrow them, swath them, let them dry a little bit because we can let that happen in the field, and then direct and then combine the swaths to get the seed. Now you've got all the straw left. And there's now quite an industry of people bringing swathers into those fields, recutting it, letting it dry, baling it, and now you've got some pretty clean hay. Now they call it straw, but frankly the feed quality of that stuff is better than a lot of the grass hay that gets made in Western Oregon. And so now there's this very nice deal where you have alfalfa from east of the mountains coming to the dairies in the west, and then on the back haul they take seed straw back to the cattlemen. And that system can work out. <clears throat> but the point here is, if I'm getting four ton per acre, it's costing me less to put up per ton than if I'm only getting two, right? And again, we need to understand what it is we've got so that we feed it out accordingly. Uh, the quote, if you don't test, it's just a guess, and that goes for soils as well as hay or silage. Um, storage, um, I think Don Ball said something about you know, storage facilities are getting paid by uh, whether you build one or not, because a lot of people are losing so much of their hay storing it outside that it's costing them, but they don't realize it. I also like this picture because apparently those cows are really talented to stand on fence posts. You gotta get the angle just right. <laughs> um, I've heard it said that, I, I've heard somebody from Missouri, so don't blame me, don't hate me, but they describe Missouri as a recreational haymaking state. He said that 50% of the hay that gets put up in Missouri never gets fed. Either they didn't need it, or they put it up and it was stored so improperly that it rotted, or when they fed it out, they had such high feed losses of it. So what does it cost you to make a ton of hay? And now if it takes you two tons to feed a ton, so that would be another way to reduce cost, plus everything else in this. It's, it's not a one size fits all. But again, difference in storage losses, less than 10% for barn stored and 25% or more from you know, storing it outside. Uh, feeding losses, as I mentioned, if you put it in a ring, it can be 13%. If you just unroll it on the ground, it can be 24%. And I understand that some people do that intentionally to build cover or put organic matter in. That's fine. You're doing it intentionally. If you're doing it without consideration, that's all I'm trying to get us aware of, is that there are losses. But if you put up a single wire over that rolled out bale, you can save $4 per bale because you're controlling the feeding. You're not letting the animals get on top of it. Make sense? Stockpiling has been talked about. We have products that fit. Uh, also, um, Brian Weech talked about some products that, Baron Brook grew up in Europe. So it may not be correct, but I think of the heart of our, of our portfolio being the agronomic forage species as opposed to the rangeland forage species. But we're developing that portfolio as well. And again, a lot of this depends on where you are. So if you go up into Alberta, I think, man, that's a hardship up there. That's got to be hard because you've got all that time when you don't have a growing, yeah, but what they have is dry. And what they have is the ability to build swaths 
So they grow these mixes and then they swath them and then they just let them sit there and even if they get snow on them, they're good and then they just bring in their portable fencing and strip those off. So they've found way, and the, the soils are frozen solid, so there's no problem with mud. So they're finding ways to make, to, to best fit their environments. Um, a quote here, feeding hay took nearly half a day every day, moving a poly wire fence for strip grazing. Stockpile fescue takes 30 minutes twice a week. As long as I'm grazing stockpile, I have time to move fences before I go to work. When it, comes, when it runs out and I start feeding hay, I feed in the morning and have to finish feeding when I get home. How many people are full-time farmers these days? I, I, I remember visiting uh, Pennsylvania and what they were telling me is whatever we do for grazing management, we have to realize it's something that they're gonna do on Saturday because they've got full-time jobs that they're gonna go to Monday through Friday. So that's a reality that we just have to keep in mind and we need to find tools that fit the situation. So that's all I had to give um, we do have a portfolio of some summer annuals that could fit. We have a full line of brassicas. We've got some uh, chicory that could fit, red, white clover, annual ryegrass, Italian ryegrass. We've got improved fescues, orchard grasses, perennial ryegrasses, um, some dry land species and some mixtures. Um, please come by the booth or the table and we're happy to have those conversations. Thank you for being here for this. And I look forward to the conversation that comes up after. Okay. Great. Thanks, Peter. So our goal in all this is to help you all uh, find answers to and solutions to, to what you're trying to accomplish. So with that, uh, Dan and Sam are coming up. We're just going to open up for any questions that you all might have. Um, and thank you for bringing those, Sam. Why don't you pick one of those up and show people what that is? We do have our <clears throat> newest product guide up here, and so anybody that would like one, we can uh, pass those out. I do have business cards for myself and for Brian up here. Yeah. Unfortunately, Peter is out <laughs> of business cards. Yeah, yeah so what, what questions do you have? Either of something you heard today or just any question in general about seeing the grazing season? Okay, while well, you all are ruminating on that and thinking of a question, my job is to ask a question so we can fill some time here. Oh, well, I do have another comment. I got one right back there. Do, do, okay. Okay, go ahead, Sam. Um, I had a period of time in my previous life where I earned the name of Mr. Clover Hater from a fo former Ford specialist in NC State because in the southeast, we do have a wild Dutch Ladino clover that grows. And it grows about that tall, thick as hair on a dog's back, and it chokes out everything else. And I've spent a career calling that a weed and saying, and, and I'm not up here for Cateva, but you know, uh, they've got some great herbicides, but I would tell producers, they'd call me and say, I've got all these different weed problems. I've got horse nettle, I've got dog fennel, I've got this, this, and this. And I'd recommend that they spray their pastures to control their weeds. Well, I don't want to kill my clover. Well, the clover is, like I say, was that wild Dutch clover that grows about that tall. I'm sorry, folks. Let's call it what it is. It's a weed because you're not getting that much yield off of it. You're not getting that much nitrogen fix uh, fixation off of it. Go ahead and get your weeds under control. And then we've got some great clovers, both for the northern part of the U.S. and then for the southern part of the U.S., that can grow. If you're in the south, you really need to look at Regal Grays as a Ladino. It was developed by the University of Georgia. We've got on red, we've got our Barduro, which was developed by the University of Florida, which both of these are going to perform well in the southeast. They're both fairly heat and drought tolerant. Then for up north, you've got Freedom and Alice for your red cloak, Freedom for your uh, red and Alice for your white. And then once you get your weeds under control, then come back and add these higher quality clovers that are actually going to yield, do more nitrogen fixation, and will improve your overall health of your pastures and be nutritionally beneficial to your animals. Yep. Great. 
let me be mindful of any questions. So, so not seeing any questions right now. Dan, I'm gonna ask you a question. So you're doing some pretty progressive grazing things. What, what was the learning curve like for you as you're developing these mixes and how to graze them and things? Yeah, you know, each farm in each region is going to have its own prescriptions, right? So if somebody in your area is not having success, you kind of have to go out and figure it out yourself, I'd say. Um, I, I mean, I learn something every season. So I think it's just, st you know, learning, learning from your mistakes, learning from your successes, tweaking the mixes. Like I, I, I do it a little different every year, it seems like. Um, so, so I think it's just building a knowledge base, making sure that you don't forget your mistakes and trying to improve upon them. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, building on that, you know, a lot of people I talk to, they're really concerned that they're gonna bet the farm on it and and mess up and and be a really expensive mistake. Well, you you can go into it slow, right? right. And, and and you know, dip your toe in before you go head first, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. A lot of the ones I mentioned, uh, you know, what, what, I, what I found, you know, after seeing Gabe Brown and kind of getting excited about polycultures, I went back and, you know, put 15 different things in there. And then as I put more things in there, I realized, okay, those are the economic ones that really work for me. Um, after hearing Dr. Christine Jones talk about soil health and about polycultures, she really said, once you get above about seven species, that's when you really kind of see um, an effect upon soil health. So I, I'm trying. I went from 13 to three to four, and now I'm trying to go back to, you know, seven or eight. But a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll lean heavy on the three or four species that really work, and then I'll sprinkle in a couple dollars at some forbs or some broadleaves or some, you know, some things that may or may not be economically my, you know, my my best forage. Yeah. How, yeah. How much of those are seeded to clean cultivation? And what kind of equipment do you need to seed right. those kind of mixtures? Um, I do more, so we, we row crop as well. So a lot of times I get the double crop on some of my row crop land and we do, we do tillage on our row crop land still, unfortunately. Um, but it also affords me um, fall grazing where I wouldn't have fall grazing if I didn't have tillage. Yeah. Um, because my summer perennials just stick around too long and kind of get in the way. Yeah. Um, so we use a, a mulch till drill, a two disc for, or for my tillage plantings. Um, and then I actually have a John Deere 1590 single disc uh, for my no-till plantings. And you can use that single disc for tillage, but it doesn't work quite as well as, as a, you know, a two disc. I've got a Kate's IH mulch yeah. till. Let me, let me add to this, and then I think I saw a hand over here. So another way to look at it, and it's kind of what Dan just said, but a good place to start is to think of, um, you know, you think of canopy, different canopy zones. We'll think of different root zones as well. So where I tell people to start is, hey, get a grass, get a brassica, which is a turnip, you know, a tea wrap or some of these products we mentioned, and look at including a legume. You know, so you kind of cover those root zones and the canopy zones, and that's a good place to start, and then you tweak it from there. Yeah. Question? Depends on how much rain you get. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, top three things I've done. I think uh, I think the main thing is having a plan in place. Under understanding your stocking rate is number one. It, you you will either make money or lose money based on having that stocking rate done correctly. Um, after that, I think uh, you know I'll. If you are new to managed grazing, um, and I'll say this, uh, just be cognizant of, of time as well, especially if you're doing a lot of this work. You have to account for paying yourself, right? You, your time isn't free. So if it's out moving cows every day, consider that that's time that should be sure. paid for, even if you're doing it. So I think we need to be really thoughtful about, um, about, t about our own time that we volunteer and, and the cost return on that. 
I say that to say that when I first got into managed grazing, I used a lot of temporary fence and it took a long time and a lot of step in posts. And I realized that uh, what I should have done immediately was set up single wire perimeters if I already have existing fence. That way I can just tie into that and have a lot less polygons and big squares and just be able to tie in with a single fence. So I think, you know, looking at your farm, coming up with a grazing plan, how much time you're willing to do to manage grazing, uh, think about shade and water, how much money you're willing to spend up front on water, because water's a big deal with grazing. Um, you know, we can, only, we can only move those cows to small areas if they've got water, and then in the south if they've got shade. Um, cost, I, I, I wish I could tell you a better number on cost per head per, um, you know, per year. I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. It's, you know, it's over probably 400 and it's under 750. <laughs> <laughs> I saw another hand over here earlier. Do we have, yeah, please. Well, I guess I was just wondering about the, um, you were talking about the early uh, grazing and the late grazing. Mm -hmm. In Montana, I believe the base yep. is called barricade. Yes. Yep. So that has metal brome, just a little bit of smooth brome. It's got a drought tolerant tall fescue and a wheatgrass in it. And that's a perennial. It's all, all those all those grasses are perennial grasses. Yep. Brian. Yep. yep. Can I do a follow up to some a question that he asked just real yep, quick? Please do. I'm still not going to give you that number. I mean, if you check with your local land grant university, they probably are going to have from their ag econ, they're going to give you some numbers. But some of the ag economists that I know just basically say you can't afford to grow cattle, uh, unfortunately, but you, you can. But as you're establishing, as you're establishing these farms, uh, check with your local soil and water natural resources conservation service. If you have running streams through your farms, now I can speak more for North Carolina, but I know it is nationwide. Uh, through NRCS, there's a program called EQIP, that's Environmental Quality Incentives Program, where they will help you to uh, do a cost share on fencing out streams, putting in watering systems, whether it be from a well or from a pond to water your cattle, to protect water quality. Now, in my county, we, we were one of the largest counties in, North, in the United States doing this because we sold it not first for the environmental aspects, but first for the business aspects of it. And then, oh, by the way, you get the environmental end of it. So uh, in North Carolina, we, uh, our um, soil and water conservation districts also have a program called Ag Cost Share, which basically operates just like the federal program of EQIP. Now, if you, you would check with your local soil and water or NRCS office about this, you apply, there's a pot of money a lot allocated every year, and then they divvy it out. They've got a score sheet when you make your application. Uh, where they'll prioritize you for, for funding. <clears throat> now, when you get, if you get into these programs, just like Dan said, you've got to count your own labor. If you're doing fencing yourself, you've got a post driver auger, you're putting up your own fences. Let's say you've got some cedar trees or some locust trees where you can cut for fence posts. You would count that towards your 25% cost share. Most of these programs have a 25, 75 cost share. You put in 25%, they will pay 75%. There is uh, some NRCS programs even for helping to do rotational grazing and get some pasture systems set up. So I've, in the last four years, I've lost some of the information, but I would say definitely check with NRCS. You can also talk to your local extension service and they can help guide you in the right direction. So there is some funding out there to help get some of these uh, programs started to improve. You're going up or down. Right? <laughs> right. And feed costs are about 70 to 75 percent of the total. So that would naturally be an area that you would start at. Absolutely. And the cover crops have made a huge difference in producers and how you feed and how much feed and what mm -hmm. you feed. Mm -hmm. That's why I asked the question because I think you've got to know where you're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I will tell you this, North Carolina State University, and you would have to Google it because it's under Ag Econ, 
but they actually have spreadsheets available. You can Google it, put in NCSU uh, CalCAF spreadsheet, and it should pull it up. And it's an Excel spreadsheet where you actually, it's not just an economist pulling numbers out of the air and sticking in there. The spreadsheet is designed so that you can actually put your own numbers into this Excel spreadsheet, and then it's gonna calculate your cost of production on a CalCAF operation. But you, have to, but you have to know your numbers to put them into the spreadsheet. Um, I apologize, it's probably on my laptop upstairs, yeah. Yeah. on my old hard drive, well, but it's and, available. And, and let me ask a follow-up question to you. As a banker, you know, one of the comments I get a lot is, hey, I can't afford to do this, right? I, I, my, my banker think I'm crazy if I even suggest doing this on my ranch. But we, you said it right. I mean, the cost savings are tremendous. So is the banking community looking at cover crops, cover grazing, things like this differently now? Or what's the sentiment there? There you go. <laughs> Good. More questions? Okay. Now I'll ask, uh, I got one more question in me, so you all can think. This one uh, is for you, Peter. So um, obviously you represent a seed company, Baron Brug. Um, there's a lot of science, a lot of development that goes into bringing some of these products that we've talked about today. W w what does that look like from the seed company what why invest all this money in finding these these forages that will provide uh, extended grazing and and how do those products come to market um, am I on? Yep. No. I'll get this figured out just about the time what yeah okay I didn't do anything <laughs> um, so one of the challenges that we face is we've got perennial plants that most of them are open pollinated. So there can be all this genetic diversity. Um, but the, a lot of the grasses that we rely on in the United States came to us from other parts of the world. And tall fescue, for example, came from three major locations. And so you get very different traits when you go and you look at large enough collections from different areas of the world. So you start with doing that, and then you have to evaluate, do these plants have desirable traits? And you need to do those in multiple locations, because today, Oregon is the major source for most of these cool season grass species. So we want to know how they produce seed there, but that's not the market. We need to get it out into the market so that they can be trialed first in small observations, then under grazing. So you get the idea that this is a multi-year process. And along the line, you're selecting to make them more uniform. And over time, it's going to take you somewhere between 10 and 15 years to successfully launch a new variety. And then you've got to get that out into production and then you've got to get it out into the marketplace for wider adoption. Why you do it is partly because of the commitment. You're, you're, you're committed to grass agriculture, for lack of a better phrase. And we have, in this country, unfortunately, we've evolved a system that allows people to introduce a new, new variety by just saying it's a new variety, and here you go. In Europe, you can't market a new variety unless it's been trialed through their controlled trialing system and can demonstrate a certain percent advantage over the existing varieties. So we don't have that here. So we've got this system that's developed 
And today in the United States, most of the cool season grass seed that's sold is of varieties that were released at least 60 years ago. And a lot of it goes back even into the 40s and 30s. And if you think about other crops, or crop, well, other crops, there I caught myself. If you think about other crops, think about where corn was in the 1940s, where corn is today, or soybeans, or cotton, or name any of the others. We've got a mindset in the United States that says, well, pasture is this marginal enterprise that only provides marginal returns, and we put it on the marginal ground. And it's like, well, let's take corn <laughs> and plant it on the marginal land with marginal inputs and management and see what kind of economy that looks like. If we can change that mindset, then we can find that we've got varieties that have been improved in digestibility by uh, up 20% in terms of fiber digestibility. We understand that crude protein in grass is a function of soil fertility and whatever contributed to the nitrogen supply. But in terms of fiber digestibility, that's a heritable trait. We can select for that. And so that's just one example. There are other examples. There's some very exciting stuff. We start to look at these secondary metabolites in some plants that might actually lower greenhouse gas emissions or might lower nitrogen excretion because the next, I'll tell you, the next mole that's going to pop up is nitrous emissions. That, that scientifically methane has been dealt with. I know it's still there in the public, but methane's been dealt with. The next one that's coming is nitrous and that's what's, that's what's really controlling the regulation in Europe right now. So I got to visit there in September, and I got sort of a, a, a sneak peek of coming attractions, uh, which is not all that encouraging. Um, but some of these secondary metabolites actually can alter the nitrogen metabolism within the rumen and help the animal absorb more of that nitrogen and excrete less. So those are some exciting things. We're seeing some differences in how much nitrogen can be fixed even by different strains of rhizobia. And so people, just like we do with grasses, they're going around and collecting different strains of rhizobia and testing them under uniform conditions and seeing how well they perform. So you asked how long it takes. It takes a while, it takes an investment, but it takes the commitment to go down that journey. And I've been pleased to be working for a company for a decade now that has that sort of commitment. Yep. We thank you for your time. We hope you got something out of this. If you have any additional questions, feel free to come by our booth. Um, we'll be around or contact us. Our contact information is up here. And if you would like a guide, there's more still up front. Thank you. Yep.